My fellow Maverick fans, I'm not gonna lie, yesterday was bad. Yesterday was less than ideal. But before we go too far down this road of dread and doom and gloom, let's remind ourselves of one simple fact. You only needed one game on the road. That's very much still in play. But as we try to dissect the Mavericks 109-97 loss in Los Angeles without Kawhi Leonard, yeah, this is going to be one of those one of those moments in this series that you circle. And if it goes poorly for you, you're going to look at this as the the missed opportunity. I have no doubt about that. So let's talk about what went wrong. First of all, something I did not foresee, the week long break, the 10 days for Luca and Kyrie in particular, did really impact the Mavericks. The Mavericks looked very much like they were just trying to feel things out in that first quarter. They were not aggressive. They were searching and not really pushing or controlling the pace kind of just playing into the Clippers hands and we saw that early on because the Clippers jump right out of the gate into a comfortable lead almost immediately to double digits and it's attacking us in a place I didn't expect them to hold much of an advantage that being Zubats bodying Daniel Gafford throughout the entirety of the game but Zubats gets like six straight points just getting position and bodying Daniel Gafford down into the paint deep for just easy lay-ins. And anytime you have that happen, that's a bad tone setter. Because I already was expecting, you know, a mixed game if we got a game from Derek Lively. He did play, he did play hard, but he also looked like an inexperienced rookie who is admittedly carrying very understandably a lot on his mind right now. So when you had Gafford get into early foul trouble and getting bodied by Zubats, that was immediate concern for me as a Mavericks fan. What's more is Dallas just couldn't buy a bucket to save their lives. They looked like a team not used to playing in that environment. And they've got guys who thrive on that. Luka and Kyrie have historically thrived in difficult environments. And yet, you have a situation where they combine in the first half to go 5 of 17. And similar to when we talked about the last Mavericks regular season win, that second quarter, it was the second quarter where this game was effectively decided. Why? Because the Mavericks managed 8 points in that second quarter. They shot, I want to make sure I got this here. I got this from uh, Kevin Gray during the game. The Mavericks, first of all, you're down like 20 points at the end of one quarter. You're down 18. But more than that, 9 of 40 from the field, 2 of 18 from 3, and only 8 points in a quarter. So that was the entire first half. 9 of 40 from the field, 2 of 18 from 3. I think Luca was like one of his first seven. And 8 points in the second quarter. That's, that's right there where this game effectively was decided. Because as you look at the specifics here, the Clippers, the Clippers were able to just control the game, offensively and defensively. When they wanted to bully the Mavericks, they were able to bully the Mavericks. Um, they, get, they got 34 in the first frame, did the Clippers, 22 in the second, 31 in the third, 22 in the second. The Mavericks never really held them in check, but you could look at it and say, if the offense is there, that game is different. It's a 12-point decision, and when you also then consider the fact that the Clippers shot 50% from three, a whopping 18 of 36 from three, compared to just 30% for the Mavericks, 10 of 33, you do kind of look at it and say, Disastrous second quarter, your, your deficit swells to as much as 29 in this game, and just the other team shooting the lights out from three. 
to the point where even Russell Westbrook is making multiple threes on you, you know you're in a rough spot. James Harden killed the Mavericks in the second quarter. When things went bad for Dallas, first it was Zubats bodying them up in the first quarter, and then in the second quarter, uh, it was Harden taking over. Harden didn't even have to do anything in the second half. Paul George had flashes here and there too. I'm not trying to take that away. But Harden didn't have to do hardly anything in the second half. He practically could have gone and bounced to another strip club at halftime and been just fine. Where this game gets away from you is in that second quarter. And I said that one of my key points I was concerned about was coaching. Jason Kidd's management of a game, whether it be his rotations, whether it be his adjusting, and just seeing a moment unfold in a game and being able to realize and act accordingly with whatever course of action he needs to take. I said I had concerns there, and I talked about this not just in the playoff run, I talked about this even looking towards the future when I assume he'll have a new contract. All of that I addressed, and it showed itself in that second quarter. When that game was blowing open, you have a moment where James Harden pump fakes on a three, shot clock winding down, Maxi Kleba gives a strong contest, Harden kicks out his left leg, into Maxi's leg, Maxi is straight up in position, Harden kicks out his leg, flops, gets the call to go to the free throw line for three foul, uh, three foul shots. Jason Kidd doesn't challenge. Even the broadcasters, even the national media broadcasters are baffled by this decision not to challenge the play. You're in a crucial moment and you're giving an automatic free throw shooter three free points. Dallas is in a situation at that point where they're down like 20 plus points. It's, it's a mind boggling decision because you can't come back in the fourth quarter. I know you might be thinking like, well, you gotta hang on to that challenge because you just don't know in a pivotal moment where you might be later. No, no, this is that pivotal moment. If you don't stop the bleeding now, if you let this hole get much deeper, you're not gonna climb back out. You're, you can lose the game now. You really can. And that's effectively what happens because that play goes, Dallas makes no effort to challenge, they get three more points. Again, the lead swells to 29 before Dallas comes out and starts to do something about it. That does come in the form of Luka and Kyrie after the break. In the, in the third quarter, Luka and Kyrie, who were a combined five of 17 in the first half, just come out cooking. Luka literally changes shoes. He was debuting some new sneaker and literally switched at halftime. We know he'll do that. And you had eight points in all of the, in the second quarter. The first three minutes of the third quarter, you got nine. They came out responding. The adjustments were good. My problem is the adjustments needed to happen earlier. And it's not as simple as just like, all right, they need to just sit and stew and Luca needs to change shoes and then we respond. Like you needed to respond earlier than that. And so as you're trying to climb out of this hole, Luca and Kyrie in that third quarter had like 20 of the Mavericks 22 points. Kyrie in particular was an absolute menace in that quarter. In the third quarter alone, Kyrie had 20 points. Eight of eight from the field, two of two from three, two of two at the line. Stellar. The problem the problem is that the hole was too big and the Mavericks still couldn't get enough defensive stops. When you had that barrage at the end of the first half where it's like, excuse me, at the end of the third quarter where Dallas hits a three, gives up a three immediately in the, in the corner where it's just like, how did you not get back and set in time for that? For the corner three, basically straight down the court. Dallas comes back, gets a three. Clippers get a three. Like, they just traded 3-3-3-3 three, 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 three with the Clippers on, like, four straight possessions. And I just couldn't help but feel like, even when you're finally making the shots, you're not climbing back into it. Hardaway hits a three at more or less the buzzer of the third quarter, and it doesn't matter because you've already fallen too far back. You're down 18 going into the fourth quarter, and that's just not a good place to be against a good team, even without Kawhi Leonard, because you're getting bodied inside, and a guy that I thought was going to be a real and true difference maker in this game, in this series, was an absolute ghost, a shell of himself. Now, part of that, he does tweak his ankle at one point early on, but Daniel Gafford was invisible out there. It was truly the first time that watching Gafford on the, on the floor for the Mavericks, other than maybe against the Pacers, where they were trying to play pace and not using him much. This was really the first time I looked at him out there, and I was like, dude, you're a liability right now. 
Daniel Gafford in 14 minutes, one of four from the field. Again, this was the man who led the NBA in field goal percentage. Three points, zero rebounds. And even when he made some good plays, he did have a, uh, a sweet block on Paul George at the rim. Paul George trying to tomahawk it over him. He gets the block, but the problem is both him and Maxi went for the block. He gets it. It's a great capping the dunk uh, effort, but the ball falls right to Zubats under the basket. Zubats gets an easy lay-in. Easy bucket. Doesn't even matter. And that just kind of was indicative of how the game went, particularly the second half, because even when Dallas forced a loose ball, whether it was the ball bouncing off of the rim a certain way, Dallas deflecting a pass, uh, picking a dude's pocket and the ball's loose now in the open court. It just, it was one of those games that kept falling back to the Clippers. It kept finding its way back into Clipper hands. And so even those 50-50 balls weren't falling Dallas's way. And when the Clippers at the end of the third quarter were a plus 24 from three, that paired with a just atrocious second quarter, that paired with a rusty, very just stagnant offense for the Mavericks in the first half. And that includes Luka and Kyrie. Kyrie had several bad plays to open this game. Luka had several bad plays to open this game. I think it was the second possession of the game. Uh, Kyrie is just watching the ball come off the rim, doesn't box out, and they get an offensive rebound that kicks straight out to Paul George for a three. And it was like, hmm, that's for a guy that had a very great leadership vocal answer two days ago about being ready, we don't got time for this shit. That was a really asleep on your feet play. A couple plays later, uh, he doesn't get into proper position and gives up an easy and one to Zubats when Zubats is just really taking over at the start of that first quarter. And the, picker, uh, the, the Clippers are just picking on Kyrie defensively. And so you're looking at this and you're just like, man, that's not good. Kyrie isn't playing great. Luka's not hitting anything right now. He's getting the looks he wants, but he's not finishing these plays. He's not able to pick on Zubats right now, but it looks more like a Zubats revenge game, although we talked about how uh, Luka just destroys Zubats. Zubats was killing the Mavericks in this game, and Luka couldn't get anything going for a good, good while. So even though you still end in a game where Luka finishes with 33 points, 13, 13 rebounds, 6 assists, Kyrie Irving ends with 31 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists on 10 of 18 shooting, you just don't have enough. Your complimentary pieces, you had one other double-digit scorer, P.J. Washington, at 11.7 boards, and uh, he was a whopping 4 of 10 from the field. Now, guys were showing effort out there. Derek Jones Jr., P.J. Washington, uh, flashes of Derek Lively a little bit as well. Just all out relentless. I loved that. The problem was that they, the Mavericks couldn't get anything going offensively, and they were just making way too many boneheaded plays. You saw Luka getting frustrated at times with his teammates, with the officials, uh, frustrated with his, himself, and they could not convert anything when they absolutely, positively had to have it. And when you have Russell Westbrook playing the old, as Nick Engstad said on Twitter, the old Patrick Beverly thing, that's ironic in itself, uh, playing to the crowd, being the instigator, and then turning around and be like, what, me? He's getting the crowd fired up. He's getting his teammates fired up. The fact that he's then also hitting a couple corner threes is getting his team fired up. He's the agitator. And it's working. And it's why I said I thought he was an X Factor in this series. Meanwhile, the guy I said was going to be an X Factor for the Mavericks, Exum, did nothing. 16 minutes, 3 points, 2 boards, 1 of 4 from the field. He was a minus 11. For as good as he was against Harden in 2018, man, I know Harden's damage was all that second quarter, but he was not a difference maker in this game. No Maverick other than Luka and Kyrie could do anything. They couldn't do anything for a first half. And... Then, even in spite of all that, this is a game where Dallas is simply outcoached. Because as I look at this, yes, Zubats had a career high 20 points, had 15 boards, was huge. But as I look at this game, despite that second quarter, despite the Clippers shooting the three the way that they did, they were right there. The Mavericks cut it within reason early in the fourth quarter, had momentum going. The way they played that whole third quarter, they got two guys finally going, but they couldn't get enough stops. And why couldn't they get enough stops? Because in a critical juncture coming out of a timeout, Jason Kidd made another, I felt, poor decision. 
And the Mavericks had used an 11-3 run to start the fourth quarter. And Jason Kidd rolls out. Now, they had had some success with small ball five. Maxi at the five. They came out of a timeout with Maxi still at the five and uh, also utilizing Harden. Harden. Hardaway. Uh, and that, that spelled doom because they had cut it to 15. They had momentum, an 11 3 run. And the Clippers just coming out of the timeout made an adjustment and just started getting buckets. Paul George alone had a 7 0 run after that. And the Mavericks kind of waffled back and forth, cutting it down a little bit, cutting it down, but it just could not get the stops that they needed. The Mavericks couldn't buy a three. Uh, again, could not do anything to get the stops they needed. And then in a pivotal moment when the game was still there, still for the taking, because the Mavericks did rebound well. As I talked about, one of the trends of them post-deadline, even though the defense wasn't there, 109 is not horrible, by the way, for how many you gave up, especially against a talented team. The problem, and the rebounding was there. The Mavericks only lost the rebounding edge or battle by four. It was 45 to 41, 10 offensive for the Clippers, nine for the Mavericks. By the way, the Mavericks also had nine blocks and seven steals. All that's great, but they could not get the key stops they needed, and they couldn't buy a three to save their lives. And so that combined with a poorly timed rotational decision, I felt put them in a hole that they ultimately could not climb out of and decided this game. For what it's worth, Jason Kidd is the Mavericks head coach is now 0-4 in game ones. That is something. I got that wrong, by the way, in my preview ahead of time. I thought they won game one against Utah two years ago. They did not. They lost that game uh, and then won the next two to be up 2-1 with Luka coming back. Foul trouble played a big role in Gafford's start. And when Gafford was immediately in foul trouble and couldn't make any sort of impact in the game and then Lively was inexperienced and not able to, to get them what they needed. He struggled at times bringing the ball in, whether it was for an alley-oop, whether it was for a rebound, whatever. It just put Dallas in a position where suddenly it's front court that had been so dominant and been such a huge part of its last month of the season run just wasn't there. And without that, and without the three-point shooting, they just didn't have the firepower they needed. Their superstars finally woke up and played like superstars, but they weren't ready. They weren't ready, and that does, to me, come down to coaching. The Mavericks, yes, you have to be better. You have to take care of the ball. You have to make your shots. Sure, all of that's true, but you have to have your guys in position and ready to go, and you have to be able to figure out how to make adjustments earlier than halftime before your deficit swells to 22 and then eventually to 29. You have to be able to do that. It's not as simple as saying, oh, they just got to do their jobs. You have to put them in position to do their jobs. You have to figure out the rotations that make sense to capitalize on that. You had some success with the small ball five in this game. I grant that was a pleasant surprise. That's a moment where I was like, ah, oh, I was kind of wrong about that. But coming out of a timeout to keep at it, dude, they just made an adjustment for that. What, what are you doing? They literally just adjusted to what you were doing because you were having success. And rather than try to counterpunch, you just allowed them to snatch the game back away and keep it out of arm's length. Your last gasp for a push to make this a game, you let slip away by poor management. Paired with the failed challenge or the, the lack of challenge in the first half, I feel like there were two significant moments in this game that Jason Kidd, I don't, I'm not putting it all on him. That would be ridiculous. That would be ridiculous. I'm not even a Kidd supporter by and large. I'm ambivalent at best. But there were two key moments that I felt like coaching needed to be a difference maker to help them over the hump and where he failed them. And if you want to talk about game plan coming in and just having the team focused and ready and prepared, you can assume a little bit of responsibility there, but I'm just talking about the game itself. Two key moments. Uh, TGK put it best. That's like two strikes for Jason Kidd. If you got a three strike setup, that's two strikes in game one. And now you just dropped a game without Kawhi Leonard by double digit points. But I'm going to close with this. My dude, Annie and Duca, had the best perspective of this. We're prisoners of the moment. We're all going to look at this and we're all going to say, oh my God, everything is awful. We'll never win a game. We're going to lose in five. We're garbage. We can't do anything here. You can't look at things that way because playoffs is all about adjustments, game to game. And again, if Jason Kidd's 0 of 4, never won a game one in his coaching experience with the Mavericks, all right, well, technically, as, a, as Mavs coach in a playoff series, He's only been beaten one time in a series, and he got us to the Western Finals for that to happen. You only have to earn a split, is Innie's point. You win game two, even if Kawhi is back, you win game two. You take home court advantage. 
Now, you just made life more difficult for yourself. You put yourself behind the eight ball, but the game, the series is not over. So I'm going to actually be here and be a little bit more positive about this and say that, yes, I called Mavericks in six. I'm still calling Mavericks in six, but I think they got a lot that they got to show. And the way they showed out in that second half, their main guys, at least, and their defensive effort and preparation, great. Role players, I said before, play better at home than they do on the road. You just got to get one guy going with Luka and Kyrie, and that is a different game, despite the Clippers' three-point shooting, despite that second quarter. You get out of your own way, or you find one more piece to get going, and you, you could have had that game. So I'm not going to look at this doom and gloom and say it's all over, because I thought the Clippers played about as well as they could have played. Does that mean they can't play like that exactly for the rest of the series? No, they certainly could. But I'm willing to bet that Dallas is closer to their level than they showed, certainly in that first half. And if they play closer to their level, like they did in the second half, for the duration of a game, for the duration of a series, I still think Dallas in six is a possibility. That's my hill. I'm prepared to die on it. We'll see. That's all my time, though. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, drop a like below, leave a comment, and subscribe to the Dallas Prospect. Until next time, guys, stay positive, be relentless, and remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace! From Prospect to Legend!